Episode 31, Berchi vs. Monaghan. Recorded December 2nd, 2013. Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. A freezing cold night in Calgary tonight, and I think we're all glad that we're inside having another fireside chat. Not a lot's happened this week, but I think the uh, the most exciting thing was probably that 2-1 win by the Flames over the Kings. What were your thoughts on that? Matt, let's start with you. Well, it was a bit of a slow start to that game, but they did manage to keep the chances down for LA especially in the first period when they were the Kings were kind of swarming you know and Ramo did play good for I think that's probably Ramo's best game first start in a long that he's time played at the NHL level yeah i mean it think about it all it's, in all it was a good you know, effort every goal flames goaltender's best game of the year because i mean what well, we played 26 games it was the first time all year that we haven't allowed uh, more than two goals. So, I mean, I-, I often think Ramo looks flustered and out of control in the net, but, you know, he did a great job. And when they could have collapsed after the Justin Williams goal, they didn't. So, good for them. It's always good to see them beat top teams. I think it's good to see their composure getting better too like in that game you know they could have collapsed but they didn't and I think a lot of that has to do with the composure and the way this team is working on that composure and in a rebuild I think that's an important thing for the team to be working on well additionally with the prospects at least um like they've been screwing up lately and giving up bad goals at inopportune times and it seems like now they're progressively starting to learn from those mistakes and not collapsing entirely. And, you know, down the road, that'll be a good thing if that kind of mental talking fortitude about prospects, remains. Um, we thought we'd talk tonight and contrast kind of two of our young prospects that have a lot of spotlight on them. We'd contrast the fantastic season that Sean Monahan is having and the less than fantastic season that Sven Berchi is having. Luke, why don't you get us started with this one? Well, it's a little bit, um, I suppose, obviously frustrating for everyone to see uh, good old number 47 not perhaps playing up to expectations. And uh, there's a lot of people that seem to think that, I mean, our head coach has a personal vendetta against one of his two star rookies, which is confusing to me. Uh, But I think... Uh, rightly or wrongly um, Sven deserves almost all the criticism he's received and by and large he's almost the only one who's worth criticizing in a sense Uh, no one else other than Monaghan is going to be here uh, super long term in terms of people that uh, could get uh, super criticized although as I say that I'll admit that uh, uh, my uh, poster child for the year tj brody has been very inconsistent the last uh last couple weeks yeah that's a guy they'll probably be here long term too is tj brody yeah but but i mean you guess you get my point right I do. it's just like who, what's the point in criticizing really criticizing michael backland or uh chris butler or any of these like as far as the media is concerned um one guy really, really needs to learn how to be a better pro. So for, on for Berchi, what do you think is the problem? Do you think he's not cut out to be an NHL pro? Do you think there's a mental issue that the team can work through? I, I mean, the team is giving him... It, more if mental. I look at the team, it looks like they're giving him play time. They're giving him time to uh, to play. They're giving him time to try, you know, to show his game. So what more can the team do, do you guys think, to you know try and help him through this mental hurdle if it is one? Well, he's really struggling with confidence. It's, it's pretty obvious. Like these, these plays where he is passing up shots to you know dish to McGratton on a two-on-one, 
that that's not you know your Alex Tange always looking for Jerome just sort of passing is what I do shut up I'll shoot when I want um Sven passing in that situation is only happening because he has no confidence. And I don't think it's a surprise that he is prone to streaks because when he's, you know, when he's going, he's electric. And it's, I don't think it's, I also don't think it's surprising that uh, he would find himself, like his most successful stretch as a pro, that his first emergency recall was when he was a two point per game player in the dub and his confidence was sky high. Yeah, and with him recently, like he's been looking a lot more like Dustin Boyd oh, from no. years gone by, and instead of the upper end skill that he actually has, and like where Boyd didn't have that high level skill, Berchi does, and like that's the frustrating part because he does have the ability to be a really really good player, but for whatever reason he just can't seem to put it all together to actually be that. Yeah, and personally, I think that it might be in his best interest to be sent down to the AHL and get a prime ice time and score a lot of goals and regain yeah, and his just, confidence that as way. As much as I don't think Hart, Bob Hartley has a personal grudge against Sven, I'm sure Sven Berti could do with, you know, a vacation from Bob. And that's not to say that, you know, if he can't, that, you know, he can't coexist at this level with Bob Hartley as the coach. But, you know, at this stage in his career, there's nothing wrong with sending him back down and having Troy Ward work with him for a month or two. It's not like, you know. Well, I think especially with how good the AHL team is doing right now, it's not like they're a bottom feeder. He would probably get a good experience going down there. He'd get a lot of ice time. He'd get a heck of a lot of points, I'd have to imagine. I think it could be a great thing for his development at this stage. Yeah, he's 21. If we look at uh, what the Leafs did with Nazim Kadri. Like, they ended up jerking him around somewhat in a similar fashion that the Flames appear to be doing with Sven. And, like, they'd send him down to the Marlies, and, you know, when, like, the fans were all going, why are you doing that? And it ended up being extremely beneficial for him, and now he's a top flight center in the league. So, you know, like, he just needs to get the opportunity to figure things out and you know they have to put him in the best chance for him to succeed as a player and that might not no, necessarily and be in Calgary wrong with at the that. moment I mean that that's key what you said is at the moment I think you know he will come back here he will be a flame for a long time if he can get through this but yeah I think as of right now he just needs to uh, work through whatever's going on and the best way to do that is to I don't want to say be banished, but be sent to the HL and become a star there. So he's, I think it'll work on his confidence. He'll see that he can do this. He'll see that he can go and win games there. There is also just an element or of, of his fortune the last little while that's just been terrible luck. Like, he ices the puck against Chicago. Bad decision, yes. He But he very nearly atones for it. The he, he you know he has the right burst. He gets to the puck off the draw, and he just can't finish it out. And that's just you know, a kid learning to play at this level. And you know, I I have to think that the coaching staff and the management, they obviously see the potential for greatness in him, but I do think they you know, they don't want him to feel like anything is going to be handed to him like he he was talking about uh in the off season you know wanting to be the next guy for this team and i think they're trying to make him understand that it's all well and good to say that but it it takes a little bit more than just words for that to happen yeah well that's it i think talked big at the beginning of the season and i know based on how he was talking when i was listening to him i thought okay Sven last year, he's ready to go, he's ready to lead this team as the young guy, and 
I think I'm disappointed by his actions not matching his words, whether that be his fault or not, um, you know, Sunday control or not. But yeah, I think maybe he does need to go down there and do what he said he was going to do. But for Abbotsford, go down there. He's the professional show that he can score a ton of goals. Win his way back onto this team. We've talked last week about all the hungry players that want NHL spots right now. So maybe it's time to make that switch. Bring up, Who would you guys bring up to replace him? I'd probably bring up Michael Furland just due to him being more suited I was going to suggest third or fourth um, Ben Street. Role. I'm done with Ben Street. I think obviously he's a useful player, I suppose, in an emergency. But I, I would, I am far more interested to see what someone like Marcus Granlund has to offer, as opposed to um, uh, Ben Street. Okay. And I think you know. Granlin's got that nice heavy shot, and I don't think skating wise, he's probably better suited to the wing, uh, at least at this level. Um, but you know, Yuri Hoodler's line right now is gone. Think about that, um, and and just a little bit of uh, say a, a Monahan Hoodler uh, Granlin line might be interesting. A Monahan Furland uh, Hoodler line would be pretty interesting yeah, to watch. Yeah, those think. would be really interesting. And I guess that that's a nice segue into the the other half of this coin, um, Sean Monahan. What what's Sean Monahan doing that uh, Sven isn't, or that Sven could learn? As far from. as you guys are concerned. Well, it, it, in Monahan's case, he's an extremely smart player, and that uh, he his skill levels and his detail work still needs some smoothing out of the rough edges, but, you know, he's just so smart that he's always in the right position in the offensive zone, and, you know, like, he just puts the puck in, and, you know, it, he's a very, very good player. I'm actually amazed that he's only 19. Does that put something into perspective, though, because just how smart Monaghan is, the way he thinks this game, because Berchi doesn't have bad hockey sense by any stretch of the imagination right like he especially when he first came up one of the hallmarks of his game was that he was always where the puck was going like he he had a very good idea of where to be at the right time um and you see so much less of that these days but it's it's still prevalent enough that you're aware that he can do it which makes him that much more frustrating yeah, that's that's a tough one. I mean, I think that Monaghan definitely has... You're right, Berchie doesn't have mm-hmm. bad hockey sense. I think Monaghan's hockey sense is perhaps more... I don't want to say more turned on, but he just seems like he's always in the game. Where Berchie seems like he seems to float in and out of the game, kind of as his mind wanders or whatever. And that's what makes it frustrating. It's like the guy's here half the time playing, he'll have a good shift, and then he'll just kind of... I don't want to say not care, but it's like his hockey sense has just vanished the next shift. I, I think it's much or almost more about uh, maintaining focus, and Monaghan is a, is able to maintain focus better. That's than probably Sven a good Berchie. way to put it. Yeah. Uh, I I I don't think it has to do with either. Like, it's not Sven's hockey sense shutting off. It's just. Yeah. No, you're right. Yeah. He's something he he he's easily distracted. Yeah, you're right. right? That's probably more what it is focus and distraction. And so, yeah, but I, th- I think you're right. Both guys have a good hockey sense. Yeah. And, yeah, Monaghan's just more um, more focused on the game, the whole game. And that's good to see. Um, but, yeah, how could we, you know, how could Sven become more focused? I'm not sure. Maturity. Yeah, right? I guess Monaghan's younger than Sven is. And this is where the AHL would really help him, just mature. Yeah, that's just a matter of time, really. Like, yeah, it, it's just a function of time, and, you know, that's part of the whole growing pains through a rebuild. You know, every all the young players are going to have to make adjustments to how they approach the game. It's just the, the nature of things. It's frustrating yeah. at times and very I, exciting So when, others. I mean, you know, we're talking about how Sven's been having a bad season. What do you think it takes for the Flames to finally give up on Sven if they're going to? What do you think? What level do you think he has to get to for the Flames to say, you know what, we're done, we'll find somebody else? 
or we'll relegate him to the A and just not bring him back. I did, I think he'd have to say something violently anti-Semitic and, you know, be photographed kicking a dog. Do so you think he's he's pretty much here I mean, for the long haul? Th- this is someone who's going to take... A, a, no, I mean, I I think of course he has to be in their long term plans. Like I, I, I think they understand there is a very specific way that they're gonna get this guy to be the player they want, but I don't think they are. I I would say at least a full year plus, like the end of this season plus another full year, and if you're not seeing anything then. Um, like Sven right now is a prime candidate for, you know, a bridge deal. Cause he's maybe if we're lucky, he figures it out in the third year of his entry level. And from there, like, you know, maybe he becomes like, Oh, you know, 60 point player next year, at which point it's going to be show, you know, you did it for one year. Let's, you know, another two year, $5 million sort of deal. And Honestly, I don't see a situation like Backland where they basically gave him a one-year last chance the NHL sort of deal coming out of his entry level. Uh, I th- I think Sven's problems are correctable. I think he just needs to you know mature as as a man. Do so you think all it is, both of you guys, it sounds like it's just some immaturity. As he matures, he'll be able to do this. Mm-hmm. And like I. Yeah, and at worst, if uh, in a couple seasons he's not quite working out, then you can always move him for something else. Like it, he, there's still talent there. At the end of the day, it's just you know, if he doesn't figure it out, maybe we could use him to. The great, you know, get third else fourth line role, and I, I would love to keep him in that role. I think he's good there until he can figure it out, and we could have a lot worse people in that role. I don't know. Just to go back to something you guys said, uh, I, I do want to say that I don't think the phrase immaturity um, is necessarily fair. I, I do think Sven is trying, because like, immaturity has this connotation like he doesn't care or, you know, whatever, just not able to handle the, the responsibilities of being a full-time NHL player and like a frontline NHL player. Uh, I, I think it's just... A, res- a level of responsibility that he is not ready he he isn't ready to take it on and he thought he was and i think you know he he needs to be able i suppose forgive himself for not being able to be the guy he wishes he was right now and just focus on becoming that down the road or was that all psychobabble Yeah, it's more well, you know, uh, we, professional immaturity, not yeah. personal immaturity. Yeah, because I, I think sense. we can all agree that we can all agree that when you watch Sven, I would say ninety-five percent of the time it looks like he is trying. Now he might not be doing the right things all the time, but I, I think there's definitely a will and desire to to get better there. Yeah. Like, there is talent there. It's just he's got to figure out where to put all the pieces in order to be that top six. Oh, yeah, there's no doubt. You see talent when the guy's in the ice. That, and you know, he you looks see like that he he's a good be. NHL player. And, you know, going back to what we were saying earlier, I think um, the fact that we are in a rebuild gives this team a lot of time to work with him and get him to where he needs to be, which I think is a, a good thing to have. And, yeah, I, I have no doubt he's going to get where we need him to be. But, yeah, I think professional immaturity is a good way to look at it. And what you guys were saying earlier, do you think maybe what's weighing on Sven's mind is that he wants to be son and he's not? And it's frustrating him at this point? He wants to be playing at a certain level or being a certain player on this team and he's not there? And maybe he's getting frustrated by that? I'm, I'm sure he is a little bit. So do you think oh, yeah, that we will ever see Sven Berchi as the, I guess, the... Num- the number one guy, the top face in this organization, because right now, as I see it anyways, um, it looks like Monaghan's probably going to be that young face going forward for the foreseeable future. Do you think that Sven can ever, I guess, unseat Monaghan as that number one young guy? Do you think he's got that kind of potential, or do you think Monaghan's going to fade it all? 
Well, I don't even think that Monaghan necessarily is the face of the future either. You know, it, we're still in the first year of a rebuild, and you really just don't know exactly what players you're going to be acquiring. Like, you know, if, say like the next two drafts we get Reinhardt and McDavid, well, you know, they're better players potential-wise than Monaghan, so they might become the face of the franchise. It, you know, it's still too up in the air. You know, yeah, and, and let's... Uh, it, it just depends. Yeah, I Honestly, I think it's silly for us to even have these discussions about Ken Sven uh, be the face of it. We don't need him to be the face of the franchise right now. Like, that that's the worst thing that we could be talking about because for all the pressure, like, you know, that he's probably putting on himself, then he hears people expecting these sorts of things, and I'm sure he wants to deliver. I'm, I'm sure he does. But it's not his time yet, and there's no sense in forcing responsibility on kids when they aren't ready for it and haven't earned it yet. Um, and and that's 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 a very important thing to keep in mind. Let's also uh, just mm-hmm. let's touch on Monaghan because it does sound like you know, as far as our discussion so far is concerned, that we haven't really given him any criticism whatsoever. And it's not to you know be hard on the guy right now or anything like that but just something I've been noticing recently although obviously he's out now is Monaghan's lack of physicality concerning anyone yeah, else it is or, or raising a few eyebrows a little bit but it you know he is 19 years old and you know, like, he, he, his frame, he hasn't filled out yet. Like, he's still, like, only, like, a, I think under 200 pounds. So, for someone that's as tall as he is, like, that's more, like, beanpole instead of, you know, mature. So, I'm not really surprised by that. You know, if in a couple of years when he fills out and is, like, more like 220 pounds, then, you know, and he's still playing a passive manner like he is now then that would be concerning but right now it, you know he's a kid you know that's not really a huge deal no, right and I, I'd agree I, I wasn't super concerned by it it's just something that I noticed in the last few games he played where he was sort of invisible for long stretches and didn't seem to be making much physical impact and I'm like oh are we gonna in in seven or eight years be talking about this guy like a Joe Thornton type who you know puts up points but sort of doesn't really use his body the way he should and thus is never really able to get it done at crunch time and then I realized you're being silly he's 19 he's probably it's probably just a you know it's probably a big adjustment to go from physically playing in the OHL to the NHL. Like, the guys are bigger, they hit harder, etc. It's, you know, I'm sure it's rough. I think one of the reasons it might have been more noticeable as well is that um, our team has been a fairly physical team this year. So I think that guys like him who aren't playing as physical stand out more than they might have in previous years. Because I think to me he's he stood out as yeah like you said not playing as physical. I'm not worried about it, but it just it's very noticeable because of that that everyone else seems to be playing really physically around him. I was just gonna say that I think the uh, the only other real question mark I have going forward is uh, what's he gonna be like when he figures out his skating stride? Because we heard this, you know heading into the draft that if Monaghan's issues were anything it was in you know he's got an awkward stride at the moment and uh it, it wasn't anything that wasn't deemed uncorrectable and I don't think it looks like a permanent thing it looks like a young kid growing into his body but um his uh, there are times let's let's be honest when he doesn't have the puck sometimes he looks like a like a newborn giraffe on the ice yeah he, yeah, he does look kind of awkward when he's skating without the puck. And you're right, I'm looking forward to seeing him grow into that stride because he can only get better once yeah. that happens. Although, and, let, but, and let's go back to being nice to him. Um, it's frankly remarkable to see that when he's, you know, 
underneath the top of the circle, like he just doesn't miss. It, it, it's phenomenal. Yeah, he's he's got great accuracy yeah. for a guy yeah, of his age. He's an absolute sure. finisher. And I feel comfortable anytime he gets the puck to know that it's going on the net, which I can't say for a lot of guys on this team. Mm-hmm. Oh, and uh, did we talk about uh, Monaghan's use in the shootout last week? No. Okay. Um, this is this falls under the be patient sort of category, but, you know, Monaghan goes, what, six? eighth and then sixth in shootout selections wins both games mm-hmm. if i'm remembering correctly yeah i think and so now people right. are like, oh, oh he'll be in the he'll be in the top three next time no I, I i don't think for the foreseeable future sean monahan should be in your top three shooters uh i think that you know once it gets past the first three all right go ahead kid see what you can do but i don't think there's a need to put that much pressure on him to go win the game for you at this stage of his career. This is just me. Well, plus additionally, in the OHL, when he was in shootouts down at that level, he wasn't any good, believe it or not. So, you know, it's one of those things that his past track record hasn't been very stellar, so... You know, like, yeah, he did win two games in a row, but, you know, you're still dealing with someone that's not, doesn't have a good track record yet. So, yeah, I agree I'd with ease what Luke was saying. I don't want to put the well. pressure on him at this point to have to feel like he's one of the three shooters that has to win the game. Should the shootout go past three? Yeah, why not put him in and give him a shot? Because, um, you know, the game could just easily be won or lost by anybody at that point. But I think, yeah, it's a lot of pressure to be in one of those first three shooters. You feel like you have to get it in to win it, win it for your team. Yeah, and, I mean, while Monaghan's junior record in shootouts may not be great, at the pro level he does seem to have that impossible-to-stop uh, low blocker, 13 inches off the ice, far post shot, just down and... I mean, honestly, that that's the move in shootouts. There, there's not a more impossible shot for a goaltender to stop than that one. And if he's got that mastered at this stage, then look out. He can only get more dangerous from here, which is great for us Flames fans. Now we've got that weapon ready for us. Yeah, I mean, th- that, that low blocker shot, like, it, it's so hard to stop. When people do it to you, it feels like the, like they've glitched you. Like, they've discovered some sort of button combination that's just a guaranteed goal. And it's enraging. Yeah, I, I never thought of it that way. But yeah, it's almost, it's, it is. It's pretty much like that glitch in your favorite video game. It's that surefire goal, or at least pretty close, where the goalie's going to be spectacular to save the thing. It's going to go in more often than not. Yeah, he, he's, the thing is, with that shot, to stop it, the goalie's got to cheat. And that's when he opens himself up to a fake deke backhand goal or whatever. Like, it's... That that move in the shootout... No, 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 I'm, I'm just saying that move in the shootout sets up everything else you do in that area of the yeah. game. I think that by not shooting him in the first three right now, we're also not going to expose a lot of teams to seeing that as often. So I think that it might still be able to be used more often than it might otherwise because teams won't see it as often. So it still becomes almost that special weapon in a way. I mean, I, I suppose. it's uh, Again, it's, it's the sort of thing that to stop it, generally speaking, you have to, you have to be either perfect with your angles or you have to cheat. And the challenge for Monaghan is going to be recognizing when the goalie's cheating him on that far blocker, low post shot and knowing when to, you know, pump fake and go the other way with it. Oh, and folks, yeah, keep in mind, um, all he has to make that decision in like eight tenths of a second while he's skating and come up with something else to do. So, yeah. 
Yeah, well, he's got a lot of other things he's trying to do at the same time and focus on. He also has to decide exactly what he's going to do and what he sees in the goalie yeah, as well. So, you know, it's no big deal. It, 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 it's, it's really easy stuff. It's easier said no, than it's done. it's really easy. That's what you need to know. <laughs> I mean, I think that's the thing. Is a lot of times we end up you know, criticizing guys in the shootout without realizing just what you said, how difficult that situation is to be in. I think it's yeah. way easier to criticize goalies in the shootout just because, and, and this might sound weird, but th- there, there's a right way and a wrong way to play shootouts um, as a goalie. And the way, okay, look, let's, and let's look at it this way. Um, the way Barra plays shootouts is really good. The way Kiprasov played shootouts was atrocious. Explain the difference between the two for people that perhaps haven't well, seen them all. Kiprasov, for the longest time, his method in shootouts was to come out to about a little bit outside the top of the crease, make himself as small as possible, so I guess he could be coiled and ready to strike, except he made himself so tiny and gave shooters so much net and wasn't aggressive at all uh, when and you know he, he was moving a lot so he was you know he's always presenting different targets for them to shoot out and i guess the theory would be maybe they'll get confused and not be able to make up their mind where they're going to go with it but of, of course what happened was uh they just shot the puck into the net and we lost a lot of shootouts red obera um is very patient, very controlled in shootouts, and he lets the opponent make the first move. And once that happens, then obviously you've got more power and control over the situation. And, you know, he's very aggressive with his angles as well. So there's your difference. Yeah. I think controlled is a good way to put it. Obara or uh, Red Obara seems like he knows what he's doing every time, and he seems like he has a plan, even though he probably doesn't every time. He seems like he's got that plan, and I often felt that um, Kipper just felt like he was going in there because he was a good goaltender. He'd figure it out as the shooter came down. And yeah, maybe that is maybe that was his downfall: is that he didn't think enough. You know, or just didn't focus any attention on that or understand how to play it properly. Well, whatever the case may be, the results speak for themselves. Um, we're, God, nearly 10 years into this whole shootout experiment, and this is the first time we've been remotely respectable at them. Uh, that's not an accident. No. Uh, you know, I didn't... Has it really been 10 years? It hasn't quite been, but it's been, you know, it's been nine-ish Really, it feels like a long time. Yeah, it it, in some ways it feels like a long time, but some some ways it doesn't feel like it's been a long time. Huh? Wow, I didn't think we'd had it for that long. Cause it came in after the first lockout, right? Yeah, oh five, oh six, and it's thirteen, fourteen now, so eight years. Well, anyone have anything else they want to chat about this week? Uh, just one thing, just a shout out, uh, on how good Emile Poirier is doing in Gatineau. Uh, he has 44 points in 28 games, 20 goals, 24 assists, and he also has 71 penalty minutes, including 8 or 9, uh, goaltender interference penalties, so he's crashing the net quite hard regularly, so. Excellent, he's gonna be our new Brad Marchand, that'd be huge. Yeah, I think we could definitely use a guy like that on this team. Oh, yeah. 100%. Well, at least with him, instead of Marchand, like, Poirier is six foot two, so, awesome. you know, yeah. he can be a and real wrecking ball instead of Marchand. I think Poirier's Marchand, also got like better um, offensive upside than Marchand did. Or does. He's a better skater, that's for sure. Yeah, I think we're going to see that he, outside of even skating, I think he's got better scoring hands. What are his points this year, Matt? Do you know? 44 in 28 games. He only had 70 last year, 
So, oh boy. You know, he's well on the way to That's awesome. smashing that. You guys, this year, the or sorry, this week, the Flames have three games. They've had a bit of a break, and they play uh, on Wednesday night, they play the Coyotes, and then there's a back to back Friday, Saturday against the Avs and the Oilers. On paper, looks like it should be a fairly easy schedule for most teams. How do you think we'll fare on that one? The only winnable game, in my opinion, is the Oilers game. Uh, you know, like, that should be easier to win. It, you know, it's one of those things that the work ethic of the Flames will determine how they do. Uh, you know, like, the Kings game, they were trying really hard to win, and they managed to do so. You know, if they have an inconsistent effort, then... Don't really expect What do you think, Luke? Six points on the table? How many do you think they'll come out with this week? I think they could do two. Two two points or two wins? T- two points. Whether it's a couple overtime losses or one and two. Uh, yeah, I, I don't really see them beating Colorado. Um, I don't have to watch them play Phoenix, do I? Because, I mean, I, I got like, I, I, I'm doing anything else. Yeah, same here. Get to go to bed. <laughs> Get to have a nice three hour nap. I think the in Flames the can I think the Flames can beat the Coyotes. <laughs> I think it'll be a stretch, but I think they could beat them. Maybe not in regulation. And I think they can beat the Oilers. So I think they could come away with four points out of the six. I suppose they could, but uh yeah. Good. We, we'll hope I wouldn't for the bet best, on it. But uh well, let's go around the table. Uh, where can we find everybody online? Let's start with you, Luke. I'm on Twitter at Luke1701. And we as a podcast are on uh, firesidechat.ca. Uh, we're on Stitcher. I think we're also we're on some other uh, podcast app for Android, aren't we? Um, we're, we're on iTunes. You can find us through... You can find us through pretty much any podcast app just by putting our feed URL in, and we'll be available to you through it. So, oh, well, terrific! And Matt, where are you? At Caged Great on Twitter, and yeah, that's about it. And our our podcast is also available on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast, so chat with us there. Uh, we have a lot of people chatting with us during the games, uh, between the games, people who are just needing their flames fix. And you can also chat with us on Facebook. We're at uh, facebook.com slash fireside chat. So hopefully we have a decent week with these three games, and we'll talk to you guys next Monday. Yep. Have a good week, everyone. All right. Suck it, Tom. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.